In this integrated rangeland management class, we've talked about lots of resources from rangelands and how they can be used and managed. We haven't talked much about how they, a person on the land who owns the land or manages the land could make money and, and therefore survive or promote conservation on land. So that's the discussion today. We're also going to talk about federal grazing fees so that people who don't understand where those fees come from will have a bit more of an understanding about what a federal grazing fee looks like from the producer's standpoint. As you know, rangelands are valuable for many resources. Most of these can be turned into economic enterprises in some way or another, but some are easier than others. Um, you could create an economic enterprise around recreation by creating a dude ranch or giving access to certain ac activities on your uh, enterprise, your operation. Um, others are more difficult, like open space. It's difficult to sell open space in a way that you could pay the mortgage and pay the taxes. Having said all that, today's discussion is going to focus on one of these resources, and that is livestock production. It is a traditional resource on which you would um, create a ranch, um, create a range operation that would allow you to pay for the land and pay for the taxes. So we're going to focus mostly on uh, livestock production today. I've talked many times in this class about rangelands being a kind of land, not a specific use. And yet when people think of rangelands, they usually think of grazing. And that's because grazing is inherently tied to rangelands. It is an, it is an essential ecological process that happens on nearly all rangelands. Um, so all rangelands are grazed, but not all rangelands are grazed by livestock. But having said that, grazing by domestic livestock is really important, and the economics is of, of it is important because it is the major human activity that happens on more acres of land on the globe than any other human activity. So in other words, if you took all the things that we do to the globe in terms of our impact right on the land, grazing affects more acres than any other activity. So therefore, we're going to continue to talk about rangelands in this presentation. Okay, one thing that many people don't understand is, is that the number of animals on uh, western rangelands grazed in the United States, those managed by U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, and even private lands, have really decreased in the last century. So in the 1900s, we had vast decreases in livestock AUMs, animal unit months, of course. So uh, cattle um, and horses have tended to stay relatively stable throughout this time, and, and the sheep production units have gone down extensively. Recently, we've seen a decrease in all AUMs. So in general, you might think about the number of AUMs on rangelands, and in the first part of the, of the 20th century, from 1900 to 1950, vast decreases and then slower decreases over time then. So what caused that first really rapid decrease in the early 1900s? Think about it. Things, things we've talked about in the class. Of course, most of that decrease in that early part of the era of the rangeland history was due to um, at the end of the grazing commons, the Forest Service, the BLM, started to take charge. The Taylor Grazing Act was in the 1930s. The BLM was initiated in the 1940s. Um, the, BL the Forest Service started charging grazing fees and starting to manage grazing early in the 1900s. So that, that was one of the main things that caused a decrease in livestock numbers, was just the, the regulation or finally getting a handle on the number of animals on federal grazing lands. Another thing that happened in economics is that during that time, early in the 1900s, animals were sold by the pound. I'm sorry, animals were sold by the head, not by the pound. So there really was no advantage to having large, well-kept animals. There was only an advantage to having lots of animals. So another thing that started this decrease, especially in the 30s, was that people started weighing animals and they started being sold by the pound. When you sell animals by the pound, it makes a lot more sense to have fewer animals that are heavier um, than to have lots of animals um, that are very light. We've also seen a decrease in livestock numbers in, in modern history. Quite a few reasons for this. Um, one is there's been a greater emphasis on multiple uses of federal lands, especially an increase in recreation. And that has caused some uh, increased awareness of the number of livestock and degradation on rangelands. So some of it has just been increased awareness
of, of the uses of rangelands. Uh, along with that, a whole uh, public sentiment against grazing and against even meat uh, consumption in our country since the 70s. Another um, point that's not listed here is that although the livestock numbers have been going down, the weight of animals has increased since the 70s. So therefore, the actual weight of animals on rangelands in the western states um, probably hasn't changed as radically as this graph might show. The, the last reason that most ranchers that raise on federal lands anyways would attribute to lower um, livestock numbers is just increased um, like regulation and litigation based on NEPA, FLIPMA, the Endangered Species Act acts that we've talked about in this class. When you start thinking about why federal laws and regulations affect grazing and management of lands, it's because many lands are grazed for the good of the public. They are managed by public laws, regulations, and policies, and those are what we would just generally called, call public lands. Much of this discussion will focus on public lands. The most significant land agencies that I'll discuss are the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service because they own most of the grazing in the West. Other federal lands that own and manage land in the West might include U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that are managed um, manage refuges for the good of wildlife. Department of Defense has an amazing amount of land and also does the Department of Energy across the West. Also, public lands would include state departments of land and other state uses of land, such as parks and recreation. So where is all this public land? Of course, it's mostly in the West. Um, Idaho is over half uh, public lands. Nevada has the most public lands, with nearly 85% of the state being federally federal lands, and most of those being Bureau of Land Management lands. But if you look at the amount of land that is used in the West, um, that is public land, you can see why public land issues and public land grazing is such an important topic. So if most of the public lands are in the West and if livestock grazing is an important economic resource for the development and use of Western lands, where are the cattle in the United States? Let's take a look at this uh, figure from the 2007 U.S. Beef Cattle Inventory. Uh, you can see most cattle are in the plains. You can see much in just the heartland of the country, blue dots where there's just a bunch of cattle. If you focus in the West, many fewer numbers of cattle. Of course, that's partly because those lands in the plains are more productive, and in many cases, that's where um, feedlots and, and finishing yards are. But having mostly to do with the productivity of the land is where the livestock are going to be. So if you summarize that, You'll see that about 19% of the beef cattle inventory is in the western 11 states, and 80% is in the eastern states. These figures are complements of Dr. Neil Rimby, who's an ag extension specialist um, that focuses on range economics in Idaho. Now, turn our attention to the sheep and lamb inventory in the 2007s. You'll see that there are several kind of pockets of uh, production, Texas, California, Idaho, Colorado, um, Utah, all important states, and those are all Western, largely Western states. So if you look at the number of animals in the West per sheep, it's, it's really about half in the West and half in the East. The large rangeland sheep operators are Western operations. The Eastern operations are more likely what we would call farm flocks, and they are smaller numbers of animals um, managed by by many people. Okay, now thinking about the use of grazing on federal lands, here's a few numbers. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management has about 8 million B AUMs of, of uh, forage that is used by livestock. The Forest Service, um, about 6,000 total 15, I'm sorry, 6 million, so a total of 15 million AUMs across the West. Um, managed by the BLM and the Forest Service. If you look at the number of animals that we saw in the previous slide for the total number of animals, you'll see that only about 3.6 of the federal of the land of the animals are grazed on federal lands. Okay, that's a little bit misleading for a couple of reasons. Um, that is on a year-long basis, even though most federal lands are used on a seasonal basis. So, for example, the Forest Service. 
um, uses has AUMs out on land only during what would be considered the grazing season, the middle of the season. BLM is somewhat the same, although there are uh, year-long permits in Nevada, Arizona, and others. Um, the other important point is that when animals are grazing rangeland, it is um, an important part of their whole livestock enterprise. So even though you can see that number and say that federal lands are not important to producing livestock because they account for only 3.6% of the animal unit months, 80 some percent of livestock in Idaho spend some time on federal lands, even though Idaho, um, only, even though only about 25 to 30 percent of the AUMs are found on federal lands, at some point of the year, 80 percent of animals spend time on federal lands. So, uh, even though it may account for a very small part, amount, it's a very important amount. Uh, in the West, it's about 40 percent of um, animals spend some time on federal lands. So that number seems low, but it's a little bit misleading. So when you think about a grazing operation, we've talked about this a number of times, you can't hang the cattle on a hook in the barn. They have to be fed 365 days a year. So that might start in the winter where you're feeding hay and animals are calving out or lambing out. And then animals, at least in the West, in a typical federal grazing um, situation that would be moved to spring uh, range on BLM, low elevation, um, a sheep especially would be moved to summer high elevation. Many uh, cattle operators also have high elevation uh, grazing permits. Uh, in the fall then they would come off of those permits when the plants begin to senesce and the snow falls on the mountains. The livestock are moved to lower elevations, often to fall deeded land, um, or it could be crop, crop aftermath or pastures on the home country. And then when, at least in northern uh, elevate or northern latitudes when the snow starts to fall animals might be transferred to winter feed. So in the whole cycle of the animal federal lands can be very important even though the actual number of AUMs um, used by those livestock may may not be as high as one would think. Another important point to think to make when thinking about the role of federal grazing lands in the in the management of livestock across the west is that those federal lands are wholly and completely integrated into the private land. So livestock grazing occurs on 95% of BLM land and 58% of Forest Service land. So it's a very dominant use of those lands. But also, as I mentioned before, over 80% of all beef cattle in Idaho graze at least part of the year on BLM and Forest Service lands. So it's a wholly integrated. I'll give the example of the OX ranch which is a ranch I've had the pleasure of working on in central Idaho, just above Council and Cambridge. They um, have high elevation forest service land on the ranch and they have permits that are BLM land down by the Snake River. The ranch is uh, 130,000 acres or so and I have to always tell the story about one time my class was working with John Dyer who is the now retired land manager out at the OX ranch and the student asked John um, how much deeded land do you have on the ranch and that would be largely these red and pink colors on the map and John said the ranch is 130,000 acres it includes forest service permits and BLM permits and some deeded land and the student said no 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 I, you don't understand I want to know how much of that of the ranch is deeded or owned privately he said the ranch is 130,000 acres it includes forest service permits and BLM permits at lower elevation and deeded land. The student persisted and said, no, no, John, I, I really want to know how much of this land you actually own. And John said, the ranch is 130,000 acres. It includes forest service permits and BLM permits and private land. The point was that the ranch to John, the, the ranch that he managed was all of those ownerships, even though only a, a fraction of that was deeded land. So when as you start talking to people about their ranch, you'll find that they easily talk about the ranch being deeded and private, I mean deeded and federal permits or state permits. They manage the ranch as one unit and all of those units are an important part of the puzzle. So <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about federal grazing permits. 
think about what this land might have been like in the early 1900s and people had been using the land it was um, not um, designated for anyone's use so it was an open commons and then the Forest Service and the BLM decided um, through regulation that they needed to start managing the land for grazing it's interesting to think about how they might have started divvying up the land and who should get those first set of permits even though many people have been using it the BLM um, was really focused on looking at two reasons that they might distribute permits um, to graze BLM lands and at that time it's called the grazing service uh, one would be prior use who had used the land previously so the first set of permits might go to the people who had just traditionally used that area another requirement to get a permit originally was what was called commensurability that was that someone who had a permit also had to have some deeded land nearby that they could provide water or or uh, forage to support livestock when they were not on federal lands There's some difference oftentimes that water was more important on BLM lands and on Forest Service lands often it required enough feed for winter for those lands at any rate when they the governments first started divvying up permits they looked at prior use and commensurability today if you wanted to buy a federal grazing permit you heard it was a good deal you wanted to buy it well um, federal permits um, are available to any US citizen or business um, to apply for um, however to get that permit you have to buy that base property that property that was set aside in the commensurability um, clause above so in BLM you need base property or um, or you may have to buy the livestock of someone who has control of the permit right now so in the Forest Service you can buy livestock and the BLM you have to buy base property it's a little different between those two agencies but in other words in order to acquire a permit you have to first acquire the property or the livestock that are tied to that permit and then the permit has to be transferred so the current current permit holder has a preference on that permit they're able to say um, that they've sold the land and now they want to give preference for that permit to somebody else they don't own the permit but they have preference um, to des designate who can be first in line to apply for the permit so in other words if you want to buy a federal grazing permit you want access to federal grazing lands you first have to buy the base property and or the livestock of someone who has a federal permit and then that person will transfer your preference for that permit to you so it's not like an open market there's not a, a general um, um, auction for federal grazing permits every year so here's where the controversy comes in um, if you look at the rate of uh, grazing an animal unit month on BLM or Forest Service land the rate is $1.35 that's what it is this year that's what it has been for several years if you wanted to buy an AUM of forage and graze some animals on state lands it varies from state to state across the west but you could expect to, to pay ten to fifteen dollars per AUM if you wanted to lease some land from um, a private leaseholder down the road it probably would cost you fifteen to thirty dollars it could be more a little bit less depending on the land so you can see where it looks to many people when they look at these numbers that the government is just giving a really good deal to those people who have preference and hold federal permits and in fact that this term welfare ranching is often used where people say that um, the federal government is giving largely giving forage away well it looks that way but it depends on what also comes with lease and what it costs the rancher so we're going to look at this now from the ranching side to see whether a federal grazing fee is really as good a deal as it looks like in these numbers to illustrate this point that not all grazing permits are the same let's think about if you were going to rent an apartment on campus two-bedroom apartment and you found the bunting apartments I'm going to pick on my colleague Steve bunting that he was he had a set of apartments that you could get a two-bedroom apartment for 350 per month my other colleague dr. strand she is an apartment building and she's renting out apartments for five hundred dollars per month the launch ball apartments are premium and they're seven hundred dollars a month so which of these are you going to choose and, and furthermore is dr. bunting subsidizing student renters well if you saw these three um, apartments they're all two bedroom apartments you might want to ask a few questions before you just sign on the dotted line you you might want to know how big it is you might want to know how far it is from campus whether heat is included in electricity is there Wi-Fi is there a pool um, is there washer and dryer included 
all of those things would change how much you were willing to pay for an apartment. Those same kind of amenities um, go into federal grazing um, permits. So I'm going to talk about those permits, but first let's talk about how, where did that $1.35 for federal AUMs come from? In the same way we might talk about where Dr. Bunting's rate of $350 might have come from. Okay, so the $1.35 grazing fee is what federal lands permits are going for right now, and that was set under the Public Rangeland Improvement Act of 1978. Um, the actual formula is right here, $1.35 um, plus and minus a few um, attributes that you the fee takes into account the forage value in index which is um, a relationship to private land lease rates in other words if uh, rates in the west are going up for private land then we would assume that the rate needed uh, for a federal permit should go up the cost of doing biz business uh, the and the cost of and the value of beef are also included so the beef cattle price index relates to the price received for beef um, grazed and then the pr um, price paid index relates to the kind of the cost of production so it makes sense that if you're trying to figure out what fee should be set for federal lands that would be reasonable that there's some basis in fact for what that fee should be um, it, you would set it on what is the rate for other types of leases how much it costs to do business and how much that um, that product is worth the dollar 23 comes from a study that was done in the 1960s that showed that it was um, it cost a dollar 23 more on private lands to graze than on federal lands. So it's an it was kind of an old study that set the baseline. The federal um, grazing fee is adjusted annually. However, um, there was an executive order in the 80s that set the grazing fee um, so that it could not fall below a dollar 35. So that's what the grazing fee is right now because it is as low as it can go if you if you uh, intake in all of these other indices. Okay, so lease fee on public lands is $1.35. Uh, there was a study in 1992 in Idaho, Wyoming, and New Mexico by Dr. Rimby and colleagues, and they found that the fed the grazing fee on private lands was nine dollars six cents so again if you look at this you think that um, the price for an animal unit of forage on public lands is is much better deal than on private lands but what uh, Rumi and his colleagues did was to look at the other amenities on grazing fees so they took into account the fact that animals are lost on on permits and that that's much higher rate on public lands and private lands it's much more expensive to move livestock to those permits on federal lands than on private lands herding is more expensive on federal or public lands and private lands um, when you put improvements in they're much more expensive on public lands and private lands plus there's a whole bunch of other fee related costs like sometimes to get a permit on federal lands you need to be part of a, an association you also have this requirement for um, meeting with uh, uh, the range operators on public lands, the range managers on public lands, and, and going to public meetings, etc. So those kinds of things are an increased rate. So in 1992, when Rimby and colleagues did this study, they found that actually the price was very similar. Uh, if you include the fee rate, but also the other costs of production, it cost about the same to graze on private and public lands it was just a slightly better deal about 90 cents per AUM to graze on public rather than private. Dr. Rimby updated these numbers for 2010 and you'll see if you update them for the 2010 values now they didn't go out and do another study they simply took those costs of production used some data from the National Agricultural Statistical Service to upgrade the numbers um, so this is not a perfect study but if you wanted to take those 92 numbers and sort of put them in 2010 numbers you would see that at least according to their calculations now it's actually more expensive to graze on federal lands than private lands but the bottom line is when you add up not just the cost of the lease fee or the permit fee but if you add in all of the other costs of production it actually costs ranchers about the same or more to graze on public lands 
at least in Idaho, Wyoming, and New Mexico, than it does to graze on private lands. So even though people say that ranchers are getting a good deal because they're only paying $1.35, when you add up all the other costs of production on those public lands, it's not as good a deal. So stepping back and thinking about economics of ranches then, um, federal grazing permits um, themselves have no value. You can't buy and sell a permit. However, as we talked about earlier, when you have a permit tied to your base property, um, that base property will be worth more. So that, that's an important reason to, to graze and, and keep value in that base property. The permit either follows the land or the livestock, so that's what gives that land or livestock value. So we have this situation in the Western lands where the, the value of the land is significant, sometimes because it's tied to federal grazing fees, but the value of the land is, is um, significant, even though it's difficult to make a living on that land, the income potential or the income earning potential on the land is low. So we have this situation where they say that, that ranchers die, live, live poor and die rich because of the value on the land that they're living. So why keep ranching if it's so hard to keep to make a living at ranching? And if you don't believe me, try to pencil it out sometime. Your ability to buy a ranch or live on a ranch just with the income from grazing or other enterprises is very difficult. So why do people keep ranching? Well, there's a lot of amenities to ranching that are not economic. Recreation, relaxation, ability to raise a family, a lifestyle, um, investments that you can see and feel. You have it. It's not in the bank. For some corporate corporate ranches, especially, it can serve as a tax shelter. And then also there's this land appreciation over time so that the investment that you're living on and seeing and using actually has value. From a local economy standpoint, grazing is also very important to support local economies, roads, schools, weed um, supervisors and weed uh, county weed shops. All of those county services that provide for land management and for education and others are often provided by people making a living in that land and in the case of western lands that's often ranching. Um, conservationists are also um, find value in ranching because it's a way to create open space and maintain open space. So we've talked a little bit about easements and uh, the value of easements to maintain open space. So in summary, those are just a few ideas of how grazing works on public lands. I think this is a very misunderstood concept. Most people don't understand how um, people acquire permits or how they are um, managed uh, across landscapes. So that's just a way to get started, some basic principles.